My name is Susan, and currently I find myself balancing a demanding career while raising my only son, Evan. Despite getting married, my passion for work has not waned. As the president of a small company, I had no concerns about a salary cut upon returning from maternity leave, thanks to a reliable team handling my business during the hectic times of childcare. However, there is another issue weighing heavily on my mind, something more personal and challenging. It revolves around my mother-in-law, Dorothy, my husband, James, our son, Ethan, and I live in a house. Ever since my father-in-law passed away, Dorothy moved in with us. Initially, we thought it would be temporary, but Dorothy showed no signs of leaving. One day, I mustered the courage to ask Dorothy, how long do you plan to stay with us? In a dramatized manner, she raised her voice and began to cry, accusing me of trying to kick her out. I was taken aback by her reaction, feeling a mix of surprise and confusion. James, who overheard our conversation, rushed to Dorothy's side and comforted her. After Dorothy stopped crying, James asked her to go to her room, leaving me alone. He immediately glared at me and accused me of being cold to his mother. I clarified that I didn't intend to tell her to leave. But James interpreted my inquiry differently, concluding that I was in the wrong. Reluctantly, I backed down, wrestling with my thoughts about Dorothy staying for an extended period. I was curious about when she would leave but felt unable to ask directly due to the fear of emotional repercussions. Dorothy behaved as though the house were her own, showing little regard for my comfort. One unexpected day, she made a startling announcement. She decided to relinquish her ancestral home and transfer all her belongings to my house. A moving truck driven by Steve, a friendly but straightforward mover, pulled up in front of their house. I was speechless with astonishment, my mouth agape in disbelief. On that day, supposed to be special for Ethan with a planned family outing to the amusement park, James disrupted the plans by declaring it a day for unpacking. Ethan, anticipating the amusement park visit, glanced between me and James with a near-tearful expression, seeking reassurance about their plans. I found myself comforting my son in the midst of the unexpected changes. I reassured Ethan, don't worry, Ethan, we'll definitely go to the amusement park. However, James frowned, questioning, are we really going to play instead of unpacking? I firmly responded that a family trip to the amusement park had been a long-standing plan, emphasizing that breaking a promise to our child for unpacking was unthinkable. I stood my ground, believing in the righteousness of my stance. The planned visit to the amusement park had been set over a month in advance. We had prepared various things and were looking forward to spending this day as a family. Spending time together was crucial for us. Yet, it was a complete surprise to hear that my mother-in-law was suddenly moving into our house. Moreover, being told that today was the day for unpacking left us bewildered. I prioritized our family plans above all. It's my policy to cherish the bond with my family. However, my mother-in-law reacted emotionally to my decision, crying excessively and claiming, Susan doesn't want to live with me. That's why she's prioritized her own child over me. Steve, the mover, realizing the conversation wasn't progressing, asked, Well, Unpacking can be done any time. Isn't keeping a promise with your family more important? Also, did you actually inform your daughter-in-law about the move? Perhaps embarrassed by Steve's rational words, my mother-in-law's face turned red. My husband, James, just glared at me, uncertain of how to react. It seemed he preferred to prioritize packing for his mother over going to the amusement park with our son. Nevertheless, I took Ethan's hand and headed to the park as promised creating a clear rift between my husband and me. One day, my mother-in-law casually broached the subject. Hey, Susan, could you possibly stay home this upcoming weekend? Seemingly oblivious to any plans I might have already made, a surge of irritation welled up inside me. Yet I strived to maintain composure in my response. Why do you ask? I inquired, striving to mask my annoyance with a tone of neutrality. She expressed her desire to spend quality time with Ethan, claiming that I was always around him, making it unfair for her. It was apparent she had eavesdropped on my earlier conversation about a mall outing plan with Ethan for the next weekend. She began to assert that I should avoid joining them at the mall, 
suggesting a scenario where James, Ethan, and herself would go, leaving me to oversee the house alone. I responded, if you're keen on visiting the mall, why don't we all go together? I suggested, hoping to strike a balance and not let Ethan out of my sight, especially not with Dorothy, whose trustworthiness had been in question since the day I witnessed her faint tears. Dorothy's expression morphed into a mix of reluctance and disappointment. She was jarred by my proposition. Voicing her displeasure was not an option, and with evident reluctance, she nodded in agreement, conceding to the new plan. At the shopping mall, I was selecting clothes for my son, Ethan, just as I had planned. Recognizing that children grow up fast, I picked out slightly larger sizes. Suddenly, my mother-in-law, Dorothy, came over and said, Don't you know his size? This size would fit Ethan perfectly. She had chosen a size that fit Ethan just right for the moment. I tried to explain that kids grow quickly, and it's better to have a bit of room in their clothes. However, Dorothy quickly retorted, when he grows, just buy new ones. Don't be so stingy. I was internally taken aback by her attitude. Continuously buying perfectly fitting clothes would be a waste of money, and our family budget couldn't afford such frequent purchases. I resisted. But then my husband, James, intervened, saying, I'm paying the bills. If you're stingy, it reflects poorly on me. Ultimately, James paid for the clothes Dorothy had picked out. Afterward, Ethan wore those clothes for a while, but in just a few months, he started complaining that they were too tight and stopped wearing them. Dorothy saw this, and her face showed a mix of emotions, a complicated blend of realization and disappointment. Deciding to sort out the unnecessary clothes overflowing in our home, many of which were no longer in use, I chose to give them to a mother friend of mine whom I got close to at the daycare center attached to our company. She was delighted to receive them, and seeing her joy warmed my heart. However, my use of this daycare center seemed to be something my mother-in-law couldn't come to terms with. She didn't try to hide her critical attitude towards me, challenging me with a stern tone. Why would you leave Ethan with someone else when I'm right here at home, and working while having a child? That's detrimental to his upbringing. Her words pierced deeply into my heart, but I felt the need to firmly state my position. Actually, I need to work too, or our finances wouldn't make ends meet, I replied. Yet, with a firm resolve, my mother-in-law further criticized me, saying, Just how much do you think your earnings amount to? I'm sure James brings home much more than you, so you wouldn't need to work for us to live comfortably. You must be incompetent at your job, she accused. Her words deeply scarred me, and at that moment, I wondered if James had ever mentioned to her that I was the president of our company. Frustrated with this realization, I felt the need to find a new way to navigate this complex relationship with my mother-in-law. I actually earn more than James, you know, mother-in-law. I said, my voice laced with a mix of confidence and a hint of sarcasm. Little did I know this remark was about to ignite a fiery response from Dorothy, my mother-in-law. How dare you speak like that? daughter-in-law. Dorothy raised her voice, a blend of shock and anger seeping through her words. To openly undermine your husband is unforgivable. Not only does she barely manage to care for our child, but she also has James assist with the household chores. And now she boasts about earning more than her husband. Can't she even show the slightest respect for him? James wouldn't struggle a bit without you around. Dorothy's voice grew louder, filling the room with her indignation. Hearing the commotion, James entered the room, a look of concern etched on his face. What's going on? He asked, sensing his son's presence as a form of support. Dorothy continued with even more vigor. Tell me, James, you don't meet Susan, do you? If it were just you, me, and Ethan, we could live happily. This woman's presence only makes our lives more constrained, doesn't it? James, slightly taken aback, responded hesitantly. Ah well. His lackluster replies seemed to fuel Dorothy's resolve. Then let's go for a divorce, she exclaimed, retrieving a divorce form from the shelf. It appeared that Dorothy had been harboring the intention of suggesting a divorce to me and James all along. Internally grappling with the turmoil, 
I came to the realization that I no longer needed a husband who prioritized his mother over his own family. However, I was determined not to give up custody. James shouted angrily, Everything about you is unbearable. You are no longer needed in our family of three, his voice trembling with anger, symbolizing the collapse of our years-long marriage. Longing for freedom from this house, or rather this relationship, I responded calmly, I understand, James. With a steady hand, I signed the divorce papers, marking the end of our relationship. Our family consisted of me, my husband James, and our grown son Ethan. However, ever since my mother-in-law, Dorothy, moved in, the tension in our home had been escalating. Disregarding our plans, Dorothy forced me to help her unpack her belongings, ruining Ethan and my eagerly awaited trip to the amusement park. When I began preparing for the move, she abruptly took James on a hot spring vacation. Ethan had been invited, but having witnessed her mistreatment towards me, he declined, preferring to stay with me. He was still upset about how Dorothy nearly canceled our amusement park plans. Respecting Ethan's decision, James and Dorothy left for their trip, leaving us behind. During their absence, I packed only mine and Ethan's belongings and had them transported by the mover, Steve. In my decisive letter, I informed James that he would be responsible for the $4,000 monthly rent for this house henceforth. I also mentioned hiring a lawyer for the custody battle and property division. Leaving the letter on the table, Ethan and I stepped into our new life. Upon their return from the week-long hot spring vacation, James and Dorothy contacted me immediately over the phone. James exclaimed, Susan, did you really take Ethan with you? Mom is upset. Shouldn't I have custody? His voice was a mix of anger and surprise. Realizing he hadn't read the letter I left, I asked James gently, could you please read the letter I left on the living room table? The living room, a space she had designed with great care, radiated warmth. He harbored serious concerns about the content of the letter. Ha, huh, if it's that letter, Mom said she'd check it first, and she's already read it. James responded, a bit bewildered, often taking his mother Dorothy's word for everything. I explained the contents of the letter. It says that you will be responsible for the $4,000 monthly rent of this house going forward. It also states that I won't give up custody of Ethan. And regarding the division of property, I'll contact you after hiring a lawyer. $4,000, James exclaimed in shock, standing frozen. He was aware of the rental status of their home, but had not grasped the actual amount. His cavalier attitude towards financial management had always been a source of stress for me. This house was a rental costing about $4,000 monthly, which I had initially opposed living in. However, James had been adamant about this house, throwing a fit in an unbelievable manner, and I eventually gave in, with him pushing the responsibility of paying the rent entirely onto me. I found myself shouldering the burden of paying the monthly rent, which amounted to approximately $4,000, while James was expected to handle other living expenses. However, James had a habit of spending money without planning, often leaving me to cover the bills. This lack of financial responsibility extended to his mother, Dorothy, who frequently miscalculated her expenses and would call me over at the checkout when she realized she didn't have enough money. I was deeply disappointed with their inability to manage money. James would spend on his hobbies and desires before prioritizing living expenses, leaving me exhausted from his financial oversights. I had contributed my entire salary to the household for a long time, leaving me with very little for myself and making life extremely challenging. Recently, the burden intensified with increased expenses for Dorothy's food and allowance. The prospect of divorce meant shedding the hefty $4,000 monthly rent. Fortunately, the house was in James's name, sparing me from future responsibilities toward him and Dorothy. However, when I asked James to continue paying, he exclaimed, Why should I pay? I don't live there anymore, and we're divorced. Dorothy even told me to leave the house, so I have no obligation to pay rent. In desperation, James pleaded for my help, but Dorothy intervened, confidently declaring, even without you, we can manage the rent. The amount you paid is nothing for James. I was flabbergasted, 
Knowing that James, with a net income of around $2,000 and hardly any savings, could not afford the rent, Dorothy seemed under the impression that James was still financially well off, leading her to mistakenly believe in his abundance. Realizing the impracticality of their situation, I urged them to consider canceling the lease and discussing it with the real estate agent. Dorothy snapped back, dismissing my concerns. Frustrated, I hung up the phone contemplating how James and Dorothy could provide a stable environment for raising a child. Ethan and I had recently moved into an apartment in a convenient neighborhood close to my workplace, creating a comfortable living environment. About a month after my divorce, James and Dorothy unexpectedly showed up at my workplace, causing a scene at the company's entrance and demanding to see the boss, which was me. I, who was out for lunch with Ethan at a family restaurant, was taken aback when I returned with him, only to find Dorothy and James causing a commotion at the reception. The child care center inside the company allowed me to have Ethan close even at work. The sudden appearance of James and Dorothy left me bewildered, especially since I had been waiting for a response to a meeting arranged by their lawyers. Dorothy, with tears that seemed more manipulative than genuine, pleaded with me, Susan, can't you just come back home? I understand you are the one providing financially, but enough with this soul-killing. It's time to put an end to this. It was clear that Dorothy believed her tearful act would work on anyone besides her son. She was intent on painting me as the villain in this situation. In response to Dorothy's pleas, James chimed in, hiring a lawyer? What were you thinking? This is a matter between us as a couple. Ethan would surely be happier with both his parents together. Despite his words, a father who prioritizes his mother over his own son only adds to the child's sorrow. Sighing deeply, weighed down by inner turmoil, I turned to James and said firmly yet calmly, We're divorced. We're strangers now. If you have something to say, please do it through a lawyer. Upon hearing this, James seemed to realize that talking to me was futile. He turned to our son Ethan, who was standing beside his grandmother and began speaking. Hey, Ethan, you'd prefer to stay with your dad and grandma, right? James said, attempting to sway Ethan. Absolutely, it must be lonely just with your mom always busy with work, added the grandmother, chiming in with her own persuasive tone. Ethan, seemingly frightened by this exchange, hid behind me and burst out crying loudly. I don't like you both, you're mean. His pure tears were far more impactful than the grandmother's feigned weeping. Resonating strongly with everyone around, employees from nearby offices quickly gathered, responding to the commotion. They ushered James and the grandmother out of the company, restoring a semblance of order. Relieved at being freed from this distressing situation, I let out a sigh of relief. Later, through my lawyer, I warned them that if they ever showed up unannounced at my office or followed me and Ethan, I would consult the police. This warning seemed to calm them down. James and his mother, who were previously living in a house costing $4,000 in rent, had to let go of their luxurious lifestyle and move into a modest apartment. But the real tragedy for James was just beginning. He had been boasting to his colleagues about living in a lavish house, and now, terrified of them discovering his downgrade to a humble apartment, he quit his job without consulting his mother. This abrupt decision infuriated his mother. Eventually, they both had to start working out of necessity. Despite their new jobs, they spent their days blaming each other for losing Ethan, engaging in bitter arguments, and struggling to pay child support while trying to make ends meet. It was a challenging situation for them. As for me, I've been doing well in my job, and despite the absence of a father, Ethan has grown into a sturdy and reliable young man. In my heart, I always believed that even without such an unreliable father figure, I was capable of raising this child admirably.